So social science research tends to fall into two broad categories. We have sort of descriptive research in which we're trying to describe what's happening or what things look like or what the situation is. And then there's research that's focused on nailing down causal relationships. And that ends up being a little bit tricky. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what goes into uh, declaring that something has a causal relationship or identifying that and some of the problems that might pop up. So we've been talking about uh, program evaluation and how would you know if a program has had an effect and how would you assess that and present that in a way that would be compelling to um, a, a funding agency. Um, but that's actually a question about causality, right? That's a question about did something have an effect and, and how do I know that? Um, and so nailing down that causal relationship and being able to demonstrate in a compelling and, and accurate way that we figured out a causal relationship is, is tricky and requires a couple things to be in place. So before we talk about that, I want to highlight that, that there's different ways to think about what we mean when we say causality. Um, and so typically when we think about sort of causality, we're operating in sort of the physical sciences kind of mindset where things are very deterministic, right? Gravity operates the same way every time. Gravity is always in operation, at least as we experience it here on Earth. Um, and it does basically the same thing. Every time you drop something, it falls. Um, that's deterministic uh, causality. But a lot of things in, in the social sciences aren't really like that. They're much more probabilistic that you could think about something as having a risk factor. It, it's increasing the likelihood that this is going to happen or it's increasing um, the frequency with which something pops up, but it doesn't necessarily determine it. And it's not a guarantee. And so again, it's a different way of thinking about causality. Things might be linked and it might be contributing, but maybe that's not the entire story that it's going to happen every time. Maybe there's some sort of probabilistic pattern underlying that. But that's a, that's a different mindset for thinking about causality. Um, a third way that social scientists sometimes work with causality is with necessary and sufficient conditions, right? That there, there's something that looks deterministic, right? This is the effect that something has, but it only has that effect when we sort of pair it with other things, when we find the right combination, that these three things in combination add up to a particular outcome. Or if one of those pieces is missing, you don't get that outcome. Um, and again, so that sort of finding the right combination of, of things working together is a slightly different way of thinking about um, causality than the probabilistic model where everything's having an effect. It's just whether or not that effect will manifest this particular time. And then there's a, a fourth way that we can think about causality, um, which is maybe what you would do if you're doing more descriptive research, which is to say there are infinite ways that the world can work and how things can fit together and combine probabilistically or deterministically or necessary sufficient conditions to produce outcomes. And so the best that we can hope to do is describe those unique pathways that happen to be operating in this particular case. And so even when we're just talking about like the idea of causality, we don't even have agreement on what we mean in sort of a philosophy of science um, kind of sense when we're talking about causality. And I think it'll get even more complicated as we go through here to try to figure out what that actually means. Okay. Regardless of what model of causality you're using, um, there's this underlying um, unspoken um, principle, which in Latin is ceteris paribus, which I think I've pronounced right. I've butchered it enough times over the years that I, I probably um, have a 50-50 shot at this point. Um, okay, but what ceteris paribus means is that all things being equal, that's sort of the unstated, unwritten um, part of any statement about causality. Of course, if the world was different, things might look different. But if the world was held the same, right, and we are able to rerun things or redo the situation, we should expect to have the same result because these things are causally related. Um, if you change the world in different ways, it might get you a different result because the world is incredibly complex and things interact and they work differently and maybe there's that necessary uh, sufficient conditions piece where things have to kind of add up just right and fit together just right to see a causal relationship in play. But if the world is the same, if things are exactly as they are now, and I redo this action, it should have the same effect if there's a causal link there. So ceteris paribus is sort of in the background of what we're saying. Um, one way that we think about this a lot in the social sciences 
is where we are working with an incredibly complex world and we're not able to do sort of laboratory science where we control all the conditions and are able to sort of guarantee um, ceteris paribus. One way that we handle this in the social sciences is to think about what are called scope conditions, right? So I have this theory, I have this relationship that I think operates, but maybe that's a relationship that only really matters in democracies. Maybe in authoritarian regimes, it's a completely different story. And I shouldn't even try to apply this theory or this idea in an authoritarian regime because it, it just won't work, right? That would be a scope condition. I would be saying in this set of situations, things are similar enough that we can say ceteris paribus, but in other situations, it's just, it's, a, it's an apples and oranges kind of situation. So thinking about what are the conditions under which a cause relationship might re realistically operate is unfortunately a tricky part of social science theorizing and nailing down causality. Okay, but assuming that we can work with that ceteris paribus idea, um, then if we're gonna make a claim about causality, it probably maybe kind of has to have four different things happening. Um, so typically, um, when we are making a claim about um, causation, there is a pattern. Sometimes we call it an association, sometimes we call it a correlation, sometimes we call it a difference. There's something between two variables that makes them sort of have a relationship. Um, and you've probably heard the argument that correlation does not mean causation. Um, this is true, right? Simply seeing a pattern isn't sufficient. We need these other pieces in place as well. Um, but folks have historically said that a correlation is at least necessary. It, it, you still have to have it um, for there to be causation. I'm putting a caveat of maybe in there. I will tell a story later that suggests that maybe correlation isn't actually something we can realistically expect to see in the social sciences even when we have a causal relationship. So it's all very depressing. Okay, um, cause must precede effect. Um, the temporal order, right? Cause happens, then the effect happens, and that's sort of how we understand causality in the world. Um, again, cause preceding effect doesn't mean causation. Um, there's another Latin phrase for that propter hoc, ergo porter hoc or something. I shouldn't try to pronounce Latin. Um, but we would typically say, you know, it, it's at least a requirement. Maybe, again, I'm gonna pick at this in a little bit, but traditionally you have to have an association, uh, cause must precede effect. Those things historically have been sort of rock solid foundations for thinking about causality. Um, a third one is one that I've added in and a few others have added in recently, but I don't think um, historically has been sort of central to how we think about causality. Um, the third piece is that you have to have a causal mechanism. You have to be able to tell a story about why something happens. And the reason for that isn't because the universe cares, right? The universe doesn't care whether I understand a process and can tell a coherent story about why a cause is, is producing an effect. Um, it's for our own purposes as people trying to understand the universe um, that it's very easy to be led astray. There's a lot of messy things that can happen. And if you can't tell a story about how two things are causally related, that maybe is an indicator that you are looking at something that's not a causal relationship, but is actually spurious. And I'll talk a lot about spuriousness. Um, so I, and I think others increasingly are, are arguing that simply seeing a pattern, being able to identify a pattern, um, thinking that there's a causal link isn't sufficient. You have to be able to tell a coherent story about that. Okay, let's talk about the idea of spuriousness. In order to say that two things are causally related, we have to establish that the association or the pattern that we are seeing is not spurious. And this is really the, the linchpin of the whole process, because if you can establish that something's not spurious, um, you, you've demonstrated essentially that it's, that it's a real relationship, that two variables are actually linked um, in the way that we think they're linked. Um, in practice, what this means is that we have to come up with strategies to rule out alternative explanations. And if you um, listened into the um, Angela Harrison Urlacher uh, housing discrimination talk that we had, 
um, a lot of what she was talking about was how do you rule out those alternate explanations, right? How do you make situations as identical as possible so that we can say it's not this other thing? I know that it's it's this relationship right here. And so you know, she was talking about how you have to give testers the exact same situation. You can't, um, you know, have one person request special cabinets um, and another person not, you know, request those cabinets because suddenly it's impossible to say if there was discrimination happening because of discrimination or if people were treated differently because one person asked about cabinets and the other person didn't, right? So um, trying to rule out all those other possible things that could possibly go wrong is what we talk about when we talk about establishing non-spuriousness and it's hard um, and may not actually be possible, but the vast majority of the rest of this class will be focused on this problem. Okay, so now I'm gonna flag that things are even more difficult than we thought, um, that the model of causality that we use of deterministic relationships between forces of nature, which works really well in physics, isn't necessarily applicable to social sciences. Social sciences have the hard problems, um, even if our math is oftentimes not as sophisticated. Um, and so in addition to our causal relationships might not be deterministic, they might be probabilistic, and so they're harder to detect um, and harder to, to know, you know, how things fit together. Um, it can also be that complex social systems end up being more or less than the sum of their parts. Um, what, is, what does that actually even mean? It can mean that we can have really complicated social systems that can be described very simply by very simple scenarios. And so if you've ever sort of looked at game theory and those little two by two tables, those are incredibly powerful tools for understanding human behavior, human behavior, which is driven by, you know, loads of different factors. A lot of times it just really drills down to these very simple um, stories that we can tell each other about strategic behavior. Likewise, um, human social systems can be more than some of their parts. In my field, international relations, there's recently been a discussion about whether or not we should think about states as having like actual consciousness, like being aware and alive. And that might seem insane, except that states, well, I should say it might seem insane, except that individual nerves and synapses within our brains don't have an awareness of what they're collectively adding up to. And there's maybe an argument that, that states live in that way, that they're able to process information and respond to their environment and do all of these things in a way that's more than just individuals doing their jobs and, and following rules, but maybe something has emerged out of that. Right? I don't know, right? That's It's possible, it's maybe crazy, but it's one of those things that we sort of have to wrestle with in the social sciences that maybe aren't as important in, in physics. Um, Additionally, human beings can optimize their behavior um, in ways that makes it really difficult to know if there's a relationship or a pattern. And so I, I mentioned the idea that for a long time, the idea that there has to be an association between two variables is absolutely necessary to be able to declare that there's causation, but not if human beings are optimizing, right? And so if you were to watch me driving through Wyoming, you might note that I'm pressing on the gas really hard at some points, and I'm not pressing on the gas at all in other points. And yet you would note that the speed of my car doesn't really change. It stays you know, solidly at 75 miles per hour. And from that, you would conclude, well, there's consistent speed and there's all this variation in the pressing on the gas pedal. There's no relationship between speed and the gas pedal. And that's ridiculous. There's obviously a relationship between how fast I'm going and whether or not I'm pressing on the gas. But what you have to take into consideration is I'm trying to drive the speed limit and I'm driving through mountains. And sometimes I can just take my foot off the gas pedal and the gravity does all the work. And at other points I'm fighting gravity and I'm pressing on the gas pedal to maintain my speed. And so because human beings can react to their environment and try to achieve a specific consistent result, it can be really hard to say whether or not there's a causal relationship because it might be that human beings are obscuring what we can measure by their behavior and their choices. Um, in addition to that, human beings are able to anticipate what might happen. And so that whole idea about time order being necessary really gets complicated because I can take actions based on what I think you might do. And based on my 
perception of you and what you might do in the future, I can take an action in the present. So is it possible that that my perception of of the future caused something in the present and that really wrecks that whole story about causality as something that's ordered by time. Um, I don't have good answers to any of these problems. These are just things that social scientists have to wrestle with and deal with. And I think reinforce that idea that theory is essential in a, in a causal relationship. That if you can, that theory is your only tool for navigating around these sorts of complexities, for saying, oh, you're not seeing a pattern here because people are anticipating the future and reacting. Or you're not seeing a pattern here because people are optimizing their behavior to meet a particular target, right? Or you're not seeing a pattern here because things are messy in this specific way. But if we can isolate these three or four things, our scope conditions, right? Suddenly we can say, aha, here's where that pattern is playing out. So even though theory isn't one of those like historically essential pieces for understanding causality, I think we as human beings wrestling with social science problems really have no better tool to try to navigate that complexity and then make it all work than good solid theory and careful attention to, to theorizing.